Masters. How are we doing, folks? Uh, this meeting of the Minnesota Center Agricultural Broadband and Rural Development Committee for Wednesday, February 28th, 2024, is now uh, in session, and a quorum is present. Uh, folks, we've got a number of bills to talk through today. Uh, we're going to hear from Senator Gustafson. You're going to hear from me twice. Uh, and then we've got Senator Housechild, who will also be presenting, uh, and Senator Liskey as well. Uh, on a number of uh, different issues. So our first order of business, Senator Gustafson, if you would please, Senate File 3528, what do you got? Hello, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. Uh, I'm excited to be here again to fight for farm to school. SF3528 is before you and it expands on a work we did last session to open up eligibility for MDA's farm to school grants to early care centers, early child care centers. Um, I'm excited at just how much interest we have seen in the child care centers from around from farm to school. We have opened up valuable new markets for our farmers and are introducing healthy local ag products to Minnesota children uh, earlier than ever before. However, the current language still excludes one of the biggest sectors of child care in Minnesota, home-based providers. So SF3528 expands on the existing statute to make these providers eligible to apply for MDA's farm to school grants. SF3528 is not an appropriation. It is simply a policy bill. There is no cost. Including home-based family child care in this opportunity is especially important for our rural communities in greater Minnesota who rely heavily on home-based settings for their child care needs. If we exclude them, we are excluding the children who live in the heart of Minnesota farmland from truly enjoying the bounty. This summer, I met extensively with numerous farmers and egg advocates who are incredibly excited about the potential for farm to school and adamant that we should be doing more to help it grow. SF3528 is one more step in that direction. I thank you for considering it. And I'd also like to um, ask the chair if he, can, uh, if he has a copy of it and can accept the author's amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Gustafson. The A1 amendment is um, moved by the author and author's amendment. Um, members, do you have any discussion? Well, as an author's amendment, I think we're all good. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the A1 author's amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, the amendment is passed and the bill is amended. Uh, Senator Gustafson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know it was just voted upon, but I could explain the amendment just a little bit to let you understand the shape of the bill. The way the bill was drafted, MDA would need to create a differently coded program in their financial systems for fiscal year 2025 and subsequent years. The amendment then corrects this so the program could continue as it does now with the desired changes. So it just puts it um, in, the, in the proper shape that we'd like it to be considered today. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Uh, we have some, uh, a testifier. Um, I know we've met a number of times, but it's going to kill me to try and pronounce your last name. Oh, that's right, Aaron. You're not on this. Ms. McKee, if you could, please, would you introduce yourself and uh, full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair Putnam and members of the committee. My name is Erin McKee, and I'm the Community Food Systems Program Director with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Um, and I am a member of the Minnesota Farm to School Leadership Team and also the Minnesota Farm to Early Care Network Advisory Group. And I work on supporting farm to school and early care in a lot of different ways. Um, and I will just thank you all for your work last year. We were so excited about the expansion for MDA's Farm to School and Early Care grant to include center-based early care settings. Um, and we're very excited this year to put forward that expansion for home-based family child care settings as well. Um, and I think you've probably heard us talk about this before, but the way the grant works, it reimburses the, the schools and early care centers for their purchases from Minnesota farmers. So um, we are very excited to open up a new channel for our farmers to sell into. And um, as Senator Gustafson said, this is especially important, this expansion for making sure that our, our children in greater Minnesota have access to these fresh local foods. Um, 
In greater Minnesota, there are more childcare spots in home-based settings than in centers, and family childcare providers are truly the backbone of our childcare in greater Minnesota. Um, just the nature of population density means that in many parts of the state, childcare centers are not feasible, and the home-based settings will always be the way that a lot of families are accessing childcare. Um, and we also know that those same home-based family childcare providers are really interested in buying from their neighbor farmers. Um, a lot of the farmers are located in those communities where those home-based child cares are located. And um, we actually at ITP, we conducted a pilot farm to early care mini grant program in 2022. Um, and we received applications from 369 home-based providers from all over the state. So we know that there's a lot of interest. We also conducted a statewide farm to early care survey in the summer of 2023. And 83% of the respondents to that survey were from home-based early care settings. And the number one support that they requested, um, that respondents requested, 73% um, of respondents were interested in finding support for funding and grants that would let them um, purchase from their local farms. And I'll just say, in case you're worried about the idea of MDA administering smaller grants to the home-based settings, um, I want to let you know that we do have four sponsoring organizations in Minnesota that um, play an intermediary role between MDE and the federal reimbursement program to home-based settings for the um, child nutrition programs. And they are currently eligible to apply for MDA's Farm to School and Early Care grant on behalf of their center-based clients. Um, so they could potentially play that same role for the home-based centers. It wouldn't mean that MDA would have to directly administer many small grants. Um, so I'll just say that our littlest eaters depend on early care meals for a huge percentage of their nutritional needs, um, their nutritional intake, and this is a window of opportunity to influence their taste preferences and their eating habits for the rest of their lives. And this bill would ensure that all Minnesota children, regardless of their care setting, can receive support to access that fresh Minnesota food. Um, so we hope you will support this bill. And you can hear from our other testifier, who's actually a provider on the ground, too. Thank you very much, Ms. McCare. Our next testifier is uh, online. That's Ms. Krismarzik. Uh, Ms. Krismarzik, are, are you available? Or are you, uh, would you please uh, unmute your uh, computer? State your full name for the record and begin your testimony when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee members. My name is Kim Krismarzik and I'm from Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, and I have been doing family child care in my home for 39 years. I currently have 12 children ranging from three months to nine years of age. I am here to speak on behalf of a home-based child care provider that would like to see the increased funding in the grant program to home family daycares. It would be great to receive support to access fresh, healthy food from our local food markets during the peak growing season. This means produce is at its fresh and tastes the best. It gives so much opportunity for the children to try new foods and to learn where the food comes from and do engaging activities such as kids using little plastic knives or diff cutters to cut vegetables different ways and we make a fun learning part out of it. With this increased funding, we can support our kids farmers and the community. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee members. Thank you very much, Ms. Krismarek, for joining us and for uh, allowing us to hear the little ones behind you. Uh, we're very grateful <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, members, do we have uh, questions or comments about Senate File 3528? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Gustafson. Could you tell me, the uh, this is going to be blended right in, I'm assuming, and so is there a maximum that can go to the to the home schools versus the center, or not the home schools, but the smaller group, the family ones versus centers. Is there any numbers there, or just what's happening? I apologize, Senator Gustafson. What's happening on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Um, I will defer to my testifier, who I think probably has a more specific answer. Ms. McKee. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Dames. Um, so the way that the current grant administration works, the amount that's available to an applicant is calculated based on the number of meals that they served in the previous year. So there's a cap to how much an individual applicant can receive based on how many meals they're, they're serving to the kids. Um, so I imagine it would be the same that an individual home-based provider, it would be based on how many kiddos they're feeding. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you for that explanation, ma'am. And a follow up question uh, that would be saying how much a family provider could get. But of the total package, is there a limit that could go to family providers versus to, to group providers? Ms. McKee. Um, thank you, Chair Putnam and Senator Dames. Um, Right now, they don't have a specific proportion that's dedicated to specific settings, but I imagine that that would be something that um, MDA would, would figure out in the administrative period um, afterwards. They do have um, different levels of the grants for first bite applicants and full tray applicants, so those who are more experienced or those who are new to local purchasing. Um, and I think they try to get a good mix of the proportion of welcoming new people and supporting those who have been doing activities. But as of right now, they don't have a specific um, percentage amount for different settings. Thank you, ma'am. Senator names? Members, uh, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick kind of follow-up to Senator Dames. Is, so you mentioned the number was 369 for the home care ones. What is it for the child care facilities? Oh, Do you have a number for that? Ms. McKee? Oh, my gosh. Chair Putnam and members of the committee, I can't remember off the top of my head. I feel like it was something like 80. So there were more. I know for sure that there were more home-based providers who applied for the mini grants than there were centers. Um, but I don't know the number off the top of my head. I can certainly follow up, though. Okay, thank Senator you. Senator Dornick. Members, any other questions or comments? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, just to the testifier, uh, or Senator Gustafson, just I brought this question up last week or so, but how do we, how do we avoid double dipping uh, if, daycares are getting state assistance uh, for some of the children and part of that is uh, feeding the kids and now we're going to bring another subsidy to, the, to, to them. Um, at what point do we make sure there's not double dipping or they're getting paid for, for, for two different sources for meals um, just so we have the tight and, and we're helping uh, facilitate uh, equipment and uh, preparation stations if it's needed, but we're not getting into the business of just buying people food um, when they're running a business. Ms. Mm -hmm. McKee. Uh, Ms. Senator Gustafson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Westrom. I think um, the idea is to expand the amount of people who will be able to have the meals. Um, and I don't know that it uh, steps on the toes of other programs. It's just giving them access to be able to purchase uh, directly from farms. Um, but if uh, the chair will allow it, I do believe that somebody from MDA can maybe go into further detail. Certainly, Senator Gustafson. Uh, if you would please introduce yourself, your full names uh, for the record, and then come as your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kate Siebold. I'm the Farm to Institution Coordinator at the Department of Agriculture. Ms. Siebold. Yes. Uh, so the, the Farm to School and Early Care grants provide direct reimbursement to grantees for Minnesota grown and raised items that they purchase. And that reimbursement is separate from federal and state reimbursement that they receive for meals served um, as a part of a federal meal program, such as the National School Lunch Program or the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Um, we recognize that the federal and state reimbursement that they receive for those meals provides their budget for all food costs as well as staffing and um, other operational costs. So the idea behind the grant is to provide direct funding for specific food costs that come from Minnesota grown and raised producers. Um, and we've heard from grantees that these funds, um, you know, kind of help 
help schools and early care providers take those, those first steps to make new connections with producers, to try you know, new items that they've perhaps uh, never purchased and, and served on their menus, and ultimately incorporate more Minnesota-grown and raised foods. Um, so it is outside of the reimbursements that they receive for their meals. Senator Weston. So Mr. Chair, um, so, is it, so is this grant generally a one-time grant? And so it's helped to just incubate the connection and uh, the daycare provider we heard from Sleepy Eye uh, with facilitation of maybe some staff or other people that help connect them to local uh, markets. And then once, once they're connected with, uh, let's just say, Apple Orchard or uh, local f fruits or vegetables or, or maybe poultry, um, they're, they're getting reimbursed from, in some cases, a federal subsidy to feed lunch to their, their children. Um, is this money going to keep re reoccurring? month after month, year after year, or is it kind of a one-time dollar and once this uh, facility in Sleepy Eye, let's just use as an example, has received their grant, made their connections, has local uh, uh, suppliers that they've uh, forged relationships, and, and so they're buying that local product instead of something from maybe Cub Foods or another grocery store or another provider where they used to maybe get some of their fruits and vegetables. Um, so, or, or can you explain that to me? Because otherwise it seems like we're paying them for buying food, because we don't restrict where they have to buy their food from in the first place, but they're getting reimbursement for it. At least I'm not aware of any restrictions. And so they could be taking that money buying locally. This would help make those connections, get the local connection purchased. Um, but, but is it ongoing or, or is it really one time to get it set up and then we'd go to another provider in, say, Wilmer and then Mankato area and then all over the state? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator. Senator Westrom, I can answer part of that question. Uh, the farm to school program in general, we would like to see expanded. We were able to establish it or put funding towards it last session. We would like to keep going. We would like to double uh, the amount. I'm sure there's nobody in this room right now who wouldn't love more money for agriculture. So that is the continuing fight for more funding because it supports two of our most important industries in Minnesota, right? Agriculture and education and early education. So if you're, if, if, if part of the question might be about like expanding the program, the answer would be yes. And then to your question, I think about how does it look on the individual daycare side or early childhood uh, home care side? Um, and if they can apply more than once, I will, if it's okay with the chair, defer to MDA to maybe answer that question if they're able to. Ms. Siebel. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, grantees can reapply for funding each year. However, um, given that the purpose of the grant is to increase the amount of Minnesota-grown and raised foods that are served in schools and early care settings and to expand market opportunities for farmers, um, we do look for how returning applicants propose to build on or increase their local purchases beyond the scope of what they did in their previous grant cycle. Um, and we've also structured the grant such that grantees can only receive the first spike grant one time. That is um, a smaller grant with no match requirement, um, and after they've received that once they are they level up to apply for the full trade grant which is larger but requires a one-to-one -one match and so this match is another way for us to um, look at how applicants uh, returning applicants are kind of start beginning to incorporate those local food costs into their budget beyond the scope of just this grant Senator Westrom members any other questions or comments for Senator Gustafson or testifiers Final comment, Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I would just expand on the last comment to say that this is an important access to food, healthy food, good food. We are a tremendous uh, agriculture state, and it should show up on the plates of our littlest ones all the way up to our high schoolers. So hopefully this program will continue to work so that we can do that just for our students. Thank you very much, Senator Gustafson, and your uh, excellent and wise testifiers. Uh, Senate File 3528 will be laid over for possible inclusion.
Okay, uh, Senator Putnam has uh, Senate File uh, 3404. Senator Putnam, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, in Minnesota, Hunger Solutions tracks SNAP redemption at farmers markets because they also administer the market bucks and produce market bucks incentives. In 2023, $462,567 was spent by SNAP participants at 108 farmers markets in Minnesota, totaling 42,929 individual transactions. Market bucks and produce market bucks added another $580,872,000 in purchases by SNAP participants. That's over $1 million spent by SNAP participants buying directly from food farmers and food makers for a $1.7 million economic impact. Uh, members, this bill makes a very slight change in the use of resources that we provided uh, prior uh, into how those use resources can be uh, employed by our friends who work in cottage foods and in farmers markets. Um, uh, this bill will amend the appropriation for grants to support EBT, SNAP, SF, MINDIP, and related programs at farmers markets. Funds may be used for staff costs related to program administration, compliance, and reporting, and are no longer limited exclusively to infrastructure costs. The bill also includes a provision to allow the commissioner to use 6.5% of the appropriation for administrative costs, as is typically convention here in St. Paul. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, this is a bill that has been brought to us by our friends who work in these farmers markets, who the, the farmers who bring the produce to those farmers markets, the individuals who do cottage foods and sell those foods in these markets. Uh, this is something that the people are asking for, uh, and that's why I bring it before you today. Uh, before we get into the discussion of the, the bill itself uh, any further or hear from our testifier, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A1 author's amendment. Okay, Senator Putnam moves the A1 author's amendment. Uh, Senator Putnam, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It just changes a couple words. It's pretty straightforward, pretty clear. Um, it's, it's one line. So it's pretty straightforward, basic stuff. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Putnam, what, what are the, what's the intent of the words that they're changing? <laughs> if you could just give us some context. <laughs> Senator Putnam. <laughs> Absolutely a fair question, Senator Westrom. Uh, the language we're changing is from four grants, quote, to, quote, and other forms of financial assistance. It's part of the spirit of the bill as a whole to make it a little bit more flexible and more dynamic uh, and more applicable and useful for the people who have to use these, these resources and opportunities. Any other, any other questions on, on the amendment? Senator Kuhn? Oh, okay, on the amendment? Okay. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment signify saying aye. aye. Opposed? A1 amendment is adopted. To the main bill, uh, questions, discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, um, sorry. I do have, you have a testify. Uh, our good pal Kathy Zeman uh, is sure. online right now, and she'd like to share a little bit about uh, why this bill is so important to her and to other people uh, who operate in the farmer's market uh, space. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Mrs. Zeman, if you are there, you can uh, turn, unmute yourself and put your camera on and uh, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Kathy Zeman. I'm the executive director with the Minnesota Farmers Market Association, zooming in from Rice County, Minnesota. Um, thank you for letting me testify this afternoon. We strongly at the Minnesota Farmers Market Association support the revised uh, language change in Senate File 3404. Minnesota Farmers Market Association is the statewide association that supports our record high number of 375 farmers markets in Minnesota. Um, we develop curriculum and train market management in the 10,000 or so vendors who produce and make food across the state on food safety, on food laws and licensing, on sales tax on food, on how SNAP EBT and WIC and the SFMNP programs work at farmers markets. Since October of 2023, we've taught 74 new farmers markets and direct marketing farmers on how to become authorized SNAP EBT retailers. Currently, only about a third of our markets, roughly 100, can afford to offer SNAP EBT due to the high cost of administering it for the markets. SNAP is a huge benefit for Minnesotans who are struggling with food insecurity, and it's a really good benefit for the food makers and the food farmers who sell SNAP eligible food products, but it's 100% cost to the market itself. So the markets, um, 
They do receive a free card reader and free transactions from in Minnesota Department of Human Services, providing they're located near an AT&T or a Verizon tower. But they still have to buy the hundreds to thousands of the SNAP tokens, depending on the volume of their SNAP shoppers. You have to come up with secure containers to hang on to all of the SNAP tokens and the market bucks and the produce market bucks and the card reader itself because it's literally cash. There's weekly paperwork to complete to count the tokens, to write the checks or to ACH the vendors, and then they have to organize the tokens and get them back out to the SNAP shoppers and rotate that through to the vendors again. And then they have to submit all of their market buck reports to Hunger Solutions. There's ongoing collaboration with all the community partners to make sure that the SNAP participants in their communities can show up at their markets to buy that local food from the farmers. There's annual PCI compliance for the card readers. It's annual tax reporting. Um, we did um, take time to work with the MDA staff on their grants team to help think about broadening the language um, in Senate File 3404 to make sure that we encompass being able to pay for some time for people to manage it, the infrastructure costs for all of those food access programs at farmers markets. This is really needed financial support and we appreciate the committee's willingness to broaden the category of eligible expenses. We also thank you very much for the $200,000 appropriation to farmers markets. Super appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zeman, for your testimony. Uh, members and discussions, Let's start with Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for this bill. Um, I am in 150% um, support for this bill. And the reason I, I am in such support is that about 12 years ago, I started a farmer's market in my community. I just threw it up there and said, who wants to start a farmer's market? And a group of, I, of us got together kind of figured out where and how we're going to do it, and we, we did it, and it's, it's, it's probably one of the most successful things in our community, especially during the summer. The, um, the work that goes into managing and organizing and scheduling a farmer's market is a full-time job. And most often, especially with the, the woman who is now in charge of it, um, she spends so many hours every day uh, preparing for this market. And it's not just a summer market. She, always, she also puts together a winter market. Um, she puts together other um, activities around the farmer's market, always looking for new, uh, new vendors and entertainment and ways to bring uh, our community together. And um, she's been doing this most of the time as a volunteer. So when uh, Ms. Uh, Zeman was talking about all of the chores and all the responsibilities that go into putting together a farmer's market, um, it's, it's a full-time job, a full-time job and a half if you want it to be really, really successful. But there's not always the funding available for the things that you want to do, for the supplies that are needed, um, to pay for entertainment, somebody to come in and sing and dance or do balloons or whatever the case may be. And so I think this is a really great way to contribute to our communities, to build the community sense, and of course, support our farmers um, and uh, support our community and build the kind of connections that, that we want. And this is a really great way to, to support all of that to happen in our community. So I, I thank you very much. And on um, behalf of the New Brighton Farmers Market, please come visit us. Senator Putnam, any comments? Beck? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, other members, questions? Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, Senator Putnam, can you tell me the 6.5%, that's the max that can be used for full administration cost of everybody involved, so not just, the, not just the distributors, but the Department of Ag, if they have involvement, any of that, the max would be 6.5%, is that correct? That's my understanding, Senator James. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In relation to that 6.5%, it, it does say, uh, growing on in, in the present statute, it says this is a one-time appropriation. Is that correct? Senator Putnam? Yes, Senator Anderson. So this has to be renewed every, uh, every biennium? 
it's for two years, and we'll have to come back. Someone have to reintroduce if they want to continue this program. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Essen. Yes, I believe that's the case. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, uh, we will be uh, laying this bill over. So Senate File 404, as amended, is laid over. Senator you, Putnam, you're off to the next bill, which is Senate File uh, 3719. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 3719, first I want to thank our co-authors, Senators Weber, Gustafson, and you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kupak. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm pleased to present Senate File 3719 today, which extends the Minnesota Agricultural Fertilizer Research and Educational Council, uh, known as AFREC, not AFLEC, but AFREC, uh, which began in 2008, is charged with improving fertilizer efficiency, farm profitability, and the environment through soil fertility research, technology development, and education. The 12-member council is comprised of both farmers and professional ag service providers who select and fund soil fertility research and education projects through a competitive grant process. Uh, and I would add, uh, members, uh, that uh, all of us know farmers. Some of us are farmers. We know how much they value this program, and this is our opportunity to send it forward, to renew it, uh, uh, and retain the integrity of the program as it is currently constructed. This legislation extends the sunset for AFREC from its current expiration date of June 30th, 2025 to June 30th, 2035. Now this council is funded through a 40 cent per ton fee on fertilizer sales. Although this mechanism is, expect to, uh, is set to expire on June 30th of this year. This bill likewise extends the collection of this fee and the association account by 10 years to 2034. Members, you may recall last session, uh, we uh, enabled greater authority to the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture to adjust this fee up or down as is necessary. As agriculture technology and the environment continue to change, it's critical that farmers continue to have access to unbiased scientific information on soil fertility and nutrient management. This will not only help farmers to optimize yields and increase profits, but also in their mission to be good stewards of the environment. With me today are Grant Anderson, AFREC Chair, and Bruce Montgomery, AFREC Research Outdoor Outreach Coordinator, who can tell you more about the Council and their work. May I proceed? Sure, just okay. state your name for the record and uh, you may begin your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Chair and uh, committee members, my name is Bruce Montgomery. I am the research coordinator for the AFRAC program and also Grant Anderson, he'll say a few more words uh, when I'm done. But I've been working for this program for about the last three years. In my previous life, I was with the Department of Agriculture, so I've been retired for about five years. And uh, Mr. Chair, I can tell you that it's truly been five years because my wife had to wake me up from my nap this afternoon and, <laughs> and uh, took me 20 minutes to tie my tie. So, but moving forward, about 20 years ago, there was an enormous amount of concerns across the ag community that our soil fertility recommendations um, were becoming outdated. There was a lot of things going on. We were seeing a lot of increase in genetics, uh, other improvements in our agricultural practices, and I think the general ag community and our dealerships were concerned that we were kind of falling behind, that Minnesota was no longer a leader in the cutting end technology in, in fertilizer management. So what happened was the Minnesota legislature uh, uh, required us to put a task force together, and that egg task force made some pretty profound recommendations, and one of them was that the egg community really needed to set, step forward and help both financially and from a leadership point of view to help resolve this problem. So in 2009, uh, AFREC was developed, and uh, since that time, we've invested over $13 million into soil fertility research. So we're going to just kind of walk you through a little bit about what we've gotten accomplished. Uh, but what AFREC's mission is, is first and foremost, is to improve fertilizer efficiency. And that goes along very well with farm profitability as well as uh, environmental benefits. 
AFRAC not only provides leadership, but long-term funding, leveraging, and probably for the very first time, it brought all of the research entities, such as sugar beet growers, corn, soybean, potatoes, and so forth, all of those people together and talk about common soil fertility uh, problems. Because a lot of times these are really rotational effect type things uh, that we need to resolve. As, as Senator Putnam had mentioned, uh, it's, it's funded by a 40 cent per ton on all fertilizer sold across the state. Uh, this costs the average farmer somewhere between six to eight cents per acre per year, depending on their fertilizer use. And the vast majority of these funds that are collected do come from agricultural production. So that generates a little over one to $1.2 million per year that goes out the door through an RFP process. And these grants are competitive. Uh, anyone can apply for these funds. You might want to take a look at this graphic on the screen. Uh, it helps us understand uh, how our costs compare to other Midwestern states. And on the left-hand side, you'll see that Minnesota's total tonnage fee is $1.16 per ton starting January 1 of this year. So that includes not only AFREC, but also the ACRA cleanup program, which is a spills remediation type program that the Department of Ag runs as well as our, our regulatory component. And you can see there's a, a wide array of fees across those states, but they really need additional interpretation to understand them all because there's many, many different things that can be included in those fees, including groundwater monitoring or technical assistance or cost sharing assistance to growers. The right graphic shows what the costs are for AFRAC type programs across our Midwestern states. Again, Minnesota's 40 cents a ton. Some states like North Dakota, Nebraska, Indiana do not have programs, but the average cost for states that do have programs is about 51 cents. So we're really kind of right in the middle uh, with our uh, neighboring states. I want to emphasize that the Department of Ag is a really important player in this whole program. We could not do this without their assistance. In 18C, uh, that uh, directs $80,000 a year to go to the department, and that goes for their staffing. And they're responsible for writing the contracts, doing the fiscal management of the program. Um, and then the indirect fees help do the, the, uh, the collection of the fees, the auditing, uh, enforcement, and so forth. So 82% of the funds that come in go out the door as competitive grants. The council is made up of 12 members. 11 different organizations, and they have the key responsibility of identifying what those research priorities are, and it's through the Department of Ag and the RFP process that uh, the uh, grant program is administered. We also have ex-official representation from the University of Minnesota, uh, the Department of Ag, as well as the edible bean industry as well. So lots of accomplishments of AFRIC. I can't possibly touch upon them all, but we did put a fairly extensive handout together for you. You probably got that in your packet, um, but there's a nice story to tell here. But basically, we've made some huge advancements in the development of, of unbiased and scientifically defensible uh, fertilizer guidelines and the associated management practices, what you call them, four hours or BMPs. We've made some big advancements over the last 15 years. Uh, another thing that we really needed to do was make sure this research doesn't do any good sitting in scientific publications and Extension's done a great job of really moving along forward with the fertilizer education and outreach component associated with this program. Uh, departments administered over 250 <coughs> grants over the life of the program. That's about 100 different projects since we've started. And again, I think one of the unexpected positive things about this program is all of the research entities are coming together and, and uh, AFRAC really serves as kind of the cornerstone because these are a lot of common problems that we're trying to resolve. Uh, one of the things that the council really was wondering about was, okay, we invested 13 million, so what? What does that mean to Minnesota farmers and our local economy? So they asked, uh, had the foresight to ask for a research project to actually examine, do an economic analysis of the program. 
Mike Schmidt from the university is here with us today if there's any specific questions on this, this research. But basically what it's telling us is that the return on investment here is huge. And uh, not only from um, uh, the farmer's perspective, but also the local economy. And that's done through increased crop yields, reduced fertilizer usage, and then the implementation of best management practice to increase yields and, and reduce cost as well. Uh, Extension's also done an extremely good job of really kind of rewriting the books for education, and they've developed, I think, what's a national educational model and making sure that we get this information out to farmers on a timely basis through podcasts and videos, Facebook. There's a lot of different ways that we need to address and get information out, particularly to our younger farmers. And, uh, and we try to invest between 10 to 15 percent of our budget into education and outreach. So this program is going to sunset soon, and I'd like to turn it over to Grant just to say a few <coughs> words about what we're asking for. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Grant Anderson. Uh, I'm a uh, fifth generation family farmer from out in uh, Senator Westrom's district, uh, Belgrade, Bruton area in the Bonanza Valley. Uh, I represent the Irrigators Association on the AFRAC board, so one of the 13 uh, members that represent the board here. Uh, but I also farm for a living, and uh, uh, farming means a lot to me, and uh, taking care of the, the land and the uh, resources that uh, we ra uh, raise our kids on is, uh, is very important to me. So as Bruce highlighted, uh, the ask, if you will, is for legislative authority to uh, extend that uh, sunset because uh, it, uh, it will end uh, in June of 2024 here. So, and, and as Bruce uh, stated, there's 11 farm organizations that uh, are represented on the AFRAC Council. All of them uh, have submitted letters of support uh, of the program. And that program is truly uh, uh, no cost to the legislature. It's a tax on us as users, and we see it as, a, as valuable uh, research that's provided to us. So uh, I can tell you on, on my farming operation, and we have a, a good size uh, a farming operation out in Stearns and Pope County, uh, the tax I figured it out today costed uh, our family farm about $700 this past year. But I see it, uh, the ROI on those dollars to be huge uh, in, the, in the amount of research that's being done at the university level. So, uh, and a little more, just uh, if I put my council member hat on or my chairman of the council hat on, that, that uh, council receives uh, in the tune of $1.1 to $1.2 million each year from this uh, collection. And those, uh, those monies are all spent uh, or issued in RFP each year. And every year, the council has an awfully tough job of allocating uh, that $1.1 $1 .1 or $1.2 million because there's far more applications of really good soil fertility research that could be done around the state, and we just don't have enough dollars to fund them. So, so with that, uh, like I said, we would like to uh, uh, reauthorize uh, the existing structure and, uh, and do that for another 10 years. And I'll stand for questions, and thanks for the time. I would like to uh, proceed. We have one more testifier, too. Do we want to do questions of, of these testifiers now, or go ahead? Okay. All right, in that case, uh, Lauren Dower, come on up, and uh, you can uh, begin your testimony, too, and then we'll go for questions. Uh, Chair Putnam and members of the committee, my name is Lauren Dower and I'm the Public Policy Specialist for the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, and I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 3719 on behalf of our 30,000 members. Since its creation, the Agriculture, Fertilizer, Research and Education Council has played a critical role in supporting the needs of farmers through its research, education and outreach initiatives that address the key challenges and opportunities in agriculture. Uh, this council and its exceptional work is a direct reflection of the collaboration between the major agricultural groups in our state. I'd like to express our strong support the, for the extension of the council and the tonnage fee that funds its projects. The council's outreach efforts are critical to our members, especially as we make strides in addressing and finding so solutions to improving the levels of nitrates found in our groundwater. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill and our commitment to improving our soils, clean water, and economic vitality in the farming community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dower. Members, any questions, comments? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, thank you. Uh, I'm, 
Uh, thank you, Grant, for coming down. Um, I'll start with you. Just looking at the council, how do you how do you verify um, you're, you're you're getting objective research? And and maybe to add to that question, I mean, do you feel uh, a pretty good objective uh, outcome, or do you sometimes how, how do you avoid maybe um, you know, a bias that, that comes back uh, either against this or against that? Or uh, how do you kind of vet that? Give us just a little perspective of that process uh, um, as, as your committee meets and how much control do you have over directing or deciding where you want to put the, put the research dollars? Sure. This is either Mr. Anderson or Mr. Montgomery. Sure, I'll, I'll field that. Thank you for the question, Mr. Westrom. Uh, so the council that uh, that we that I chair and that uh, represents the AFRAC board uh, meets three times per year, uh, once in conjunction with the Minnesota uh, short course that's put on by the Crop Retailers Association. Uh, and at that meeting, it's typically uh, 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 most of the day meeting that we'll hear from each of the uh, researchers that have ongoing research projects. And we'll get kind of status updates to where those research projects are and many of them are in maybe year one or year two of a three-year study. Uh, so we'll, make sure, we'll get, uh, get the updates and make sure that the research that they're doing in those projects is on track with what we expected or what, we were at, what, what the ask was at the beginning of those research projects. Uh, then uh, uh, I should back up then. Our, our summer meeting then is typically held at one of the research and outreach centers where a lot of this small plot research is taking place. So we, get to, we as the council gets to see that, uh, that research hands on and get to walk those plots and, and uh, listen to those researchers and explain to them, explain to us as a council uh, what those projects are and we get to see firsthand the results. Uh, then uh, the, the final meeting of the year is, is typically early January, and that's uh, uh, our allocation meeting. The RFP is issued in the fall, and we'll, we'll, we'll be privy to all of those applications uh, uh, prior to that meeting to review them, and they're ranked on a, on a scorecard uh, in terms of uh, most valuable for, for us as, uh, as individuals or researching. And then uh, the council uh, chooses, uh, frankly, which projects to fund and which not. Obviously, we'll give some priority to those projects which are already ongoing. So even though this, some of the projects are uh, multi-year projects, they're asked to come to the council to fill out that RFP every year. And we feel as a council that's important to make sure that project is staying on task. So even though many of these projects are multi-year projects, they have to go through that funding process every year and, uh, and be renewed and allocated funds. So. And Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. Um, so, so the 13 members, can you give us just a smattering of, I mean, you're as an irrigator association on there, I assume it's, is it mostly, or remind us, is it mostly ag commodity groups that are paying the, the fee that are also benefiting from the research, or is there some, uh, you know, environmental groups or some land groups or other citizen groups that, that, that uh, make up the 13 and just ultimately where I'm going with this question is I just want to make sure we are uh, not setting up an, a fund that can go rogue or go wild and all of a sudden uh, the same fund you're funding is, is shutting down irrigation and shutting down farming practices because they've somebody funded some research to uh, have an agenda as opposed to, to, to advancing uh, you know, conservation practices or conserv uh, practices to improve irrigation or improve uh, yields, uh, you name it, improve erosion. Uh, um, just, 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 you kind of get the gist of my question. I just want to yep. know that we're, where we're going with this and that, that it's not just a fund that's going to go rogue someday. Um, the, the sunset, I think, is helpful to kind of keep that tension and balance in place. Mr. Anderson? Certainly appreciate that concern, Senator Westrom, and it's a concern I would have as well, and I do have as a taxpayer. And, and to remind you, the, the, all of the uh, users of the fertilizer are the, are the taxpayers or the people that are paying into this, uh, this fund. Uh, the, the 12 or 13 members on the, on the council then that are in charge of allocating these funds are the Crop Retailer Association, the Corn Growers Association, Soybean Growers, Sugar Beets, Wheat, Potatoes, 
and then Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, Irrigator Association, the Grain and Feed Association, and then the Minnesota Crop Consultants Association. So I will tell you, everybody has their farmer hat on and uh, make sure that those funds are, are put to good use when we're in those committee meetings. And thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, one thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. Uh, I just raise that issue because I think it's relevant as we look at extending this uh, now from what typically has been a five year to a 10 year. That's, if I had any reservation, it's just, I think it's always good to put the legislative uh, review and set of eyes on it to uh, have that kind of accountability. I'm <coughs> open to a 10 year, but I, I wouldn't oppose a five year sunset extension either just because I think it's a good healthy part of the process to make sure it's doing what uh, it was set out to do and, and it's not, not a fund that's kind of getting off in a different direction. So it doesn't sound like it. I appreciate you guys' oversight of this and, and the information we can ultimately gain out of it, which is improving practices and, and opportunities. And so on a personal note, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, last time I saw Mr. Anderson was in the commons of uh, Fergus Falls and uh, happened to be the volleyball team my daughters were playing on, playing his <laughs> school. And uh, I can't remember who won that exactly, <laughs> Mr. Anderson. but. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Westrom. Good to see you again. Strategically forgetting. Is that what that is? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Westrom, would you like us to probe deeper into who won that match? Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, we'll I'll say that Senator Westrom has two very good daughters that okay. play on the varsity <laughs> team. <laughs> uh, members, any other questions? Okay. Chair, may I sure. just add a sure, little Mr. bit to the previous question to Senator Westrom about the there's also a peer review process uh, that takes place uh, as far as screening and trying to address your concerns. And a lot of these applications, almost all of them come through the University of Minnesota. So, so it's a small group of researchers. A lot of times they peer review those, those projects. They collaborate between themselves. By the time we see them, they're, they're, they're top-notch scientific projects. So as... as uh, uh, as Grant has said, that uh, our big problem is we have so many good projects. That probably our biggest challenge is trying to whittle it down and make, you know, make it affordable. So it does go through a, a fairly rigorous review. Thank you. Senator Putnam, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just would like to say, uh, partially inspired by uh, Senator Western's line of questioning, but also Mr. Anderson's testimony, that this is a, a fantastic program where farmers are funding researching about farming. Uh, it enables them some control, some influence, some capacity. Uh, one of the things that I hope that we say as often as we can in this committee is that farmers want to be good stewards of the land. Farmers want to take care of their livelihoods and of their legacy. And this is one very concrete, specific place in which farmers participate in helping themselves do better so that we can all do better. And so for that reason, uh, thank, I want to thank my two uh, friends here who helped us testify, uh, and um, uh, our friend from the Farm Bureau who testified as well, um, and our uh, co-authors, uh, you, uh, Mr. Chair, and Senator Gustafson, and Senator Weber. It is a bipartisan effort to renew this, uh, this work and to value it, not just to renew it, but to value it. And so members and Mr. Chair, I thank you for your time. Senator Putnam, thank you, too, for bringing this forward. And I will also add on to that, uh, as Mr. Montgomery said, it's very nice when, when those things are not just sitting in a dusty journal somewhere and they're actually getting out and getting applied. And our Cooperative Extension Office does, does a great job at that. So, so thank you all for testifying today. So with that, uh, Senate File 3719 uh, will be laid over for consideration in a final omnibus bill. Uh, and I believe next up we will have uh, Senator Hoschild. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Senator Hoschild, if I just can take one brief moment to apologize publicly to Senator Westrom, uh, because I forgot to thank him as a co-author, because he is now one, um, but also to tell you Mr. Anderson was talking a whole lot of stuff about volleyball when I was just back there. <laughs> uh, 
Senator Housechild, we move to Senate File 3952. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Agriculture Committee. Uh, I will start by saying I'm envious of all of you on this committee. I wish I was a part of it, uh, but alas, we only get so many, right? So um, today I'm introducing Senate File 3952, and I do have, Mr. Chair, an A1 amendment. And I can uh, describe that as well. Sure. Senator Housechild moves the A1 amendment. Uh, Senator Gustafson moves the A1 amendment. Uh, Senator Housechild, to your amendment. So this amendment just changes the effective date to after passage rather than August 1st. Pretty simple technical change. Um, so this bill um, really is about supporting rural communities accessing Mr. Chair, are you good? Oh, Senator Hassan, I'm sorry, if I could just take one more moment. I think we're going to adopt the amendment before you oh, actually I'm present sorry. the bill, yep. if that's acceptable. Yep. Uh, so, uh, members, any discussion of the A1 amendment? Author's amendment? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment passes. Uh, uh, Senator House Child 2, uh, Senate File 3952 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and first, I just want to say thank you to the Office of Brad Broadband. Excuse me. Um, they do really, really great work, um, and I think we're we have a really you know successful office here in Minnesota doing that work. And I just want to applaud them for that before I kind of move forward with some of the challenges we face in broadband. Um, I know many of you have heard me say this before, but I represent the largest and most rural district in Minnesota. Many of the communities in my district are some of the most isolated places in our state along the Canadian border, uh, near the Boundary Waters Canoe area, many places that have hard rock, mining, things that are very, very hard uh, when considering things like fiber and broadband. So this challenge uh, is, is pretty unique to rural and greater Minnesota, but in particular, northern Minnesota with the geography that we have. Have. Um, and driving around my district, um, I struggle with cell service. I, I quite literally cannot have phone conversations when I'm driving. And when I try to work from afar, from Ely or, or different places, it's a real struggle even within businesses and coffee shops to get the proper broadband that we need. What that does is it impacts our rural communities from having the equitable quality of life that many of uh, our citizens require if they want to decide where they want to raise their families. And so this is really a, an issue that I impacts our rural communities most. Luckily, last session, um, we passed $100 million uh, in broadband funding. Thank you all on this committee for pushing for that funding. Um, of that, $40 million was allocated for the lower population density program. Um, this program is designated, as you can imagine, to support broadband programs to include criteria for passing of miles, so really, really low dense areas, ensuring that we really get to some of our most rural communities. Um, last session, I, I believe it was Senator Seeberger, who I know stepped away, um, she was willing to introduce an amendment um, alongside, I had asked her to, to increase the percentage of the state cost for that program to 75% from 50%. That was a really, really big jump and a really crucial thing that we did to help rural communities who have very very low proper, uh, property tax bases and funding in order to get their broadband projects approved. Um, however, uh, even lowering that local commitment to 25% in many of my communities is not enough. Um, I have very, very small communities that I have heard feedback from that even with that 25% match, in order to get broadband, we're talking sometimes over a million dollars in local match required, which is just completely unsustainable uh, for many of the townships in my region. So I just want to say, you know, thank you to Senator Seeberger, but also I think we have more to do. Um, so what this bill would do is it would change the lower population density program to allow for a state allocation of 90% compared to the current 75%, so a local match of 10%. And this change from the, the work that I've been doing in my district would allow many of the townships and, and very small communities in my district to qualify for the low density program. Um, and specifically, um, I brought a, a township uh, supervisor to, to testify, but I do wanna just give very briefly um, if I can find it in my notes, some numbers for the broadband program that we passed last year. Um, for the border-to-border -border program, which is the larger, um, less dense 
uh, pool of funding, there were 31 applicants, excuse me, there were 38 applicants worth $65 million uh, for a $35 million pool. But for the lower density, so the more rural areas, they had 31 applicants for $85 million and only $20 million available. So already, even in the program that we passed last year, we see a higher demand in our rural communities with less money available. That, that to me is unequitable, that, that is unfair. Um, and what this would do is, is put us, push us one step closer to making sure that our rural communities can access the funding that they need. And with that, Mr. Chair, happy to answer questions or pass it to my testifier. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Let's uh, hear from our uh, testifying friend, if we could, who I believe is online. Um, Ms. Keo, Keo, uh, if you are, please, could you uh, unmute your microphone, oh. turn on your camera. Oh, she is there, okay. Uh, she, uh, unmute, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Melissa. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senators. My name is Jan Keo. I'm a supervisor for rural North Star Township, which is about 25 miles north of Duluth, um, inland, not on the shore. My six mile by six mile township has 203 residents in 85 homes. And around our lakes, we host maybe 40 second homes and cabins. I want to tell you how important um, SF3952 is to incentivizing broadband providers to serve low density areas. North Star and other local townships have been working since 2009 to bring broadband to our communities. The reason North Star has not has failed to attract a broadband provider is our low density of customers, the high cost building out infrastructure, and the fact that broadband infrastructure doesn't come close enough to us. We, and we certainly appreciate the fact that return on investment is very important to these providers. Recently, a major provider has been building a network in Lakewood Township and wants to expand to our next door neighbor Normana Township, so they're getting closer to North Star. We have had two online meetings with this provider, um, and they seem genuinely interested in applying for Minnesota grant funds once the new federal funds become available. However, they have told us that they would need at least 80% of the project funded by a grant to meet their cost needs. In low density situations, matching the grant funding is challenging. And this is why the low density grant program needs to fund a higher percentage of these grants. Thank you, Senator Hoschild, for introducing this bill, and I, I urge this committee to support it. The low density grant program gives us hope that our rural low density township might qualify for projects that are financially feasible for a broadband provider. To achieve border to border broadband, Minnesota is now down to the high cost areas such as North Star. Our families are needing telemedicine, online streaming education, working from home online, conducting business online, and, conducting, and connecting with family through internet video. I grant that many cities are in need of broadband too, but our rural citizens, including our farmers, need high-speed internet the same as everybody else in the state. Um, we need incentives for broadband providers to ad address low, rural low-density areas. This bill, if passed, would really help bring providers to many rural areas that are struggling to get fast internet to our citizens. Um, thank you so much, Senators, for the opportunity to tell our story. Thank you, Supervisor Keo. Uh, members, uh, questions, comments? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Hostchild. So it's my understanding you're looking for the 90%. That would be to the end of, so you're in a township, so that's rural. Would that be to the end of the driveway then? And then the property owner pays from the driveway to the house? Senator House Town. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. I don't know the logistics of whether it goes to the driveway or to directly to the home. Senator House, this actually might be a great moment for us to invite that's uh, what I was the say. committee's pal, uh, Ms. Mackey. Uh, Ms. Becky, if you would please uh, come to the, the, the desk, state your full name for the record, uh, and uh, if you could help us out a little bit, that'd be appreciated. Certainly, thank you, uh, Chairman Putnam and uh, Senator Dames. Uh, my name is Bree Mackey, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Office of Broadband Development. 
Uh, to answer your question, any of the grant programs that the state would have um, made funding for, it does get to the premises. So there is not an additional charge, like say the line extension is what you're sort of uh, talking about there, I believe. But when we do a grant, um, it is to get service to that home or business. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Madam, Mr. Chair. And I'll just to follow up, uh, Senator Hoschild. That's kind of interesting because in many of my townships, it's between $1,600 and $2,000 because you have to pay to get from the driveway. You have to pay up your driveway to the house. And so here we're asking for basically a free pass. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering why those people aren't putting skin in the game to get from the driveway up the driveway like the rest of us in many other townships have to. Senator Housechild or Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe the issue here might be that you may not be getting the state program and there may be another agreement that you have with a provider where maybe the municipality or the county uh, requires that, whereas the low density program, it sounds like from the previous comment, uh, you know, does not require that. So it's just a state program versus maybe another circumstance in your area, but certainly happy to explore that further and you know, not looking for a free pass by any means. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Follow up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and then Senator Hostchild. I think you're right that that's what it is, but that doesn't make it fair. Hmm. I mean, you really need to have skin in the game in some of this stuff. And I can understand, I fully understand, I've got places in my district that have some real issues, and they're certainly not like the issues you would have fully understand that. Mm -hmm. But I do think you have to have skin in the game, and it looks to me like that's really not going to be happening. Thank you. Uh, Senator Housechild, Ms. Mackey, no. Uh, members, any other questions or comments? Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is this just for individual homeowners, or does this apply to um, towns, schools, libraries, all of those things? Senator Housechild. Thanks, Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish. From my understanding, these would be community applications through the low density program. So I don't believe it's an individual application. I do believe there is a line I forget what the name of the line extension program that would be for individuals, but this would be more a communal application process. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, maybe I'll start with uh, um, Director Mackey. Um, Director Mackey, we, we just have adopted the 75% threshold recently. Um, have we even sent money out the door yet, or how much have we sent in the low density program? If you can uh, update the committee and refresh us on that, uh, just just to kind of put it into perspective, and then I got a couple, of, few more questions and comments. Director Mackey. Thank you, Chair Putnam and uh, Senator. So we've had, um, currently we have awarded one grant round with the low population density program. That was last fall and we awarded almost $30 million. Those dollars came from capital projects funds. So we've officially awarded and are contracting um, for those projects. There were nine awarded projects and again for almost $30 million just under that. Um, we are currently in grant round nine, and as Senator uh, indicated, during that application process that we'll soon be making awards, we had 31 applications for the $20 million um, in excess of $85 million in applications. So uh, once we make those awards, we will have two separate grant rounds um, that we will have more data to give you. Senator Westrom. So Mr. Chair and Ms. Mackey, um so if I understand your next grant round, you have 31 applications, 85 million in projects for, for 20 million going out. Is that a summary? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, uh, Chair and Senator. Yes, that is it correct in summary. Senator Westrow. So, so Mr. Chair and Ms. Mackey, uh, is it correct to infer that most of them projects were, were good, there just wasn't enough money to cover them, or did, did several of them get thrown out because they just didn't look like they were good projects, um, so the demand isn't isn't as high as 85 million. Uh, or how would you characterize that if you could, Director Mackey? 
Uh, Chairman and Senator, so the first round, so again, last fall's round, we had over 80,000 in applications for that 30 million. We had incredible applications and yes, not enough funding for that. Okay. This round, again, I don't have all the finalized numbers. Hopefully we'll have that in the next week or two of what we'll be awarding. But I can tell you that these are excellent applications and we did run out of funding. There may be a couple in the mix of the 31 that need to work on it, but essentially there's just not enough funds uh, to fund all those projects. Okay. Senator Westrom. And Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Mackey, thank you. And um, Senator Hochschild, um, somewhere I wanted to go with this was just put a little history here in perspective. Uh, Ms. Mackey's done a nice job of kind of summarizing it. Um, I was probably the first or one of the first senators that was proposing uh, an increase over the 50% uh, grant for the rural broadband program. Uh, when I brought 65 and 75% in about five or six years ago, I remember having the discussion with the director then, and um, they weren't necessarily opposed to it, but they were concerned that we would be raising the threshold too soon because there was still a lot of good projects many good projects that they couldn't fund, Mr. Chair, at the 50% level. And so, um, so I had to hold off for a few years, um, uh, a little miffed by that, but, but understandable so. I mean, the taxpayers, we want to get them the best bang for the buck. The private investment should be there as much as possible and leave it back to the private investment. So my concern, as Senator Hochschild, isn't that we're, we're going to try to find a program to help uh, your constituents as, as we have many of us around this table helped other rural parts. Um, my concern is that there's still a lot of good projects. We have just done the first round at 75%. This is very new. And so I might submit that your constituents will find uh, a lot of improvement in their opportunity in your district over the 75 percent, let's give it a chance. I'm concerned maybe uh, the, the same as, as many others were before, that if we jump to 90 percent now, uh, we all of a sudden uh, put a bigger carrot out there and people will jump for the 90 percent money. It'll be less money going towards more, towards more projects and just more money going towards fewer projects. And so if we have a lot of good projects that are at 50% or 75% respectively. Um, I think it's a hard discussion we need to have as a committee and, and, and I'm happy to talk with you further on this, but uh, I just don't know if we're quite ready for 90%. Um, I, I'm, so I'd, I'd like to just explore that option. And Ms. Mackey, I just maybe t t to ask you um, what, what would we do with 90% and how would we uh, decide if it's 90% or 75% if, uh, if there was two different types of projects, uh, a grant, grants received? Um, have you thought that through at all? Or right now you're, you're, you're evaluating 75%, but they have to be certain low density, uh, and the other projects are generally 50%. Uh, how, how do you differentiate those projects already? Director Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chairman Putnam and Senator. Um, so I will just say I am here to be a, a technical resource at this point. Um, I haven't had a chance to really think through uh, what a 90% grant application would look like, what that criteria would be. Um, you know, that's certainly something that we would have to look at at our office and how we differentiate that. But at this time, I'm not in a position where I have anything for you. And, and Mr. Chair, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Director Mackey, so please don't see that in any way. Uh, um, and Senator Hochschild, I, I, I love this discussion, so um, it's great to, to bring these bills forward. And uh, it's a great situation to be having because we're talking about rural broadband and border-to-border -border connection, and uh, we know all the benefits that result from economic development to working at home to really uh, giving a lot of benefits. But I, I do, and I grew to appreciate 
the, the, the wisdom of the prior directors that said, let's not fund these projects until we're really out of good projects at the current level because the other thing that happens, and I think your testifier alluded to it a little bit, is a neighboring township all of a sudden becomes the next project. And once that neighboring township or residential area becomes, then all of a sudden getting to that second township is, is much more palatable, much more of a, a viable a business case because, because now you've got internet you know, five or six miles closer and so the, the next project, so we have seen that progression even over the 50% uh, where a project uh, five years ago wasn't even close to making sense at 50%, but once more of the 50% match projects got it done, then all of a sudden the next ones become more viable at 50%. And so I just raise this caution. I'm not trying to uh, say it to, uh, say, to, to say we don't do anything more, discuss your bill. I just want us to be very wi eyes wide open, wide awake to what we have seen happen, how we best use this money, and I don't want to put more government money into something that we can leverage private equity or private investment in. And um, if we've got a lot of good projects, as Ms. Mackey alluded in the proposals of four projects for every dollar that we're spending of the 20 million, I think we should get further down the road of those 75% low density projects and then see, see where we're at, Mr. Chair. Just some food for thought as we contemplate this. Um, best use of money and how do we how do we connect to rural Minnesota and uh, I think lastly Mr. Chair I've talked a lot but just uh, I'd be interested in Senator Hostile's re response but lastly and there's probably going to be a point where we need a discussion about at what point does it do, do we do we look at a different technology and uh, your, some of your areas uh, Senator Hostile are just making me think of you know what if what if somebody wants to live on an island on one of your la nice lakes up there? Uh, that's generally not a great uh, opportunity for many people, but what if they want to live on an island and they need internet? And then what if many people want to live on an island and are, are we going to set the standard that we're going to put internet to this island for one person and that island for another? Uh, I, I, makes me think of a, a scenario up around Douglas County where there's an island in one of the lakes and. Uh, it's one we've boated before, and there's a really nice house, house on it. But the locals uh, tell, tell me that what happened is the person that wanted to live on that island ended up having to build the bridge to get to that island before they could build their nice house out on there. And so that's a, just a, a little more of the discussion we're going to have to evolve into at some point. And uh, if we go to 90%, do we, do we, do we start bringing those types of scenarios in, and, and is, are, we, are we ready for that type of scenario yet? So food for thought, Senator Hostile, look forward to talking to you more on this, but just some thoughts I want the committee to think about uh, as somebody that's wanted this com program to be as robust as possible, but how do we how do we best stretch the dollars? Thank you, Senator Westrom. And I want to assure you and the other committee members that the two uh, sort of conjoined issues that I hear you raising, one about the ripeness or is now the time, uh, that's a, a concern that we are going to address and can keep talking about. Also, this issue of scope of consequence, how much good can we do with what kinds of resources? Those are both issues that are at top of my mind and I think things that we'll continue talking to Director Mackey and Senator Housechild about. But in the meantime, Senator Housechild, would you like to respond? Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Westrom. You know, I think I really appreciated your comments and your questions. I have a feeling that you and I have a lot similar of a district than myself to a lot of my own caucus. So I think we're dealing with a lot of uh, the same issues and, and I hear exactly what you're saying. I think my concern um, is that it feels like to me, rural people, rural communities are constantly told to wait. Wait for the funding, wait your turn, you're not dense enough, you don't have the property tax base, the industry can't come because of the permit. Whatever it is, rural is constantly told you don't get what the urban centers get, you don't get what the suburbs get. 
And I think the reason that we created the low density broadband program, which it sounds like you were a part of Senator Westrom, um, is because we realized that there was higher demand, or, or excuse me, that the funding was not getting equitably to all of the people of Minnesota. I would say what I'm maybe getting at here and maybe needs to be fleshed out is an ultra low density broadband program. Because it's clear to me that there is an abundance and more demand for the low density program than the border to border program. And if that's the case, why did we put more money towards the border to border and not the low density? Why, why did we put more money towards, let me repeat myself, why did we put more money towards the border to border broadband program than the low density program if there is higher demand for the low density program? The answer is because rural is continually told to wait. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that we need to reach all Minnesotans equitably when we pass state programs. Um, and does it need to be worked on? Does it need to be maybe massaged a bit? I think it does, and I would love to work with you on that, Senator Westrom. Um, and hopefully we can figure out a way to reach you know, every Minnesotan so that they can thrive and have vibrant communities. Uh, Senator Gustafson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as Senator Westrom was talking, it just made me think about it, and I apologize if you already uh, sort of addressed this in your presentation, but looking at the map of broadband coverage, I am not surprised that Senator Hochschild is here. His entire district, with just a couple of green specks in there, is either unserved or underserved. Um, which goes to the point, and I know from experience as somebody who talks on the phone with Senator Hochschild quite often, that his phones are, it's always dropped, right? It is, it is a problem. It's a problem for me because I'm trying to have a conversation. Um, but uh, I, you know, I'm not surprised looking at his uh, Senate district that he's here today advocating for his community. And I, you know, he said it much better than I was going to say it, so I'll just leave it with Senator Hochschild's words. But it is, as somebody who did grow up in a small town, um, it's tough. We are always told to wait. And so I do think that um, asking for this additional funding or an expansion of the program for the lower population density broadband is a good idea. And I just, I, I think that I understand that we need to rework it and then everybody's going to come in and then they're going to want access to and, and that's fine. We, they can come and advocate for their communities as well. But um, it does not surprise me and I applaud him for coming to advocate for his community. This is a lot of red in pretty much his entire uh, Senate district. So we need to work on that. Thank you. And Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. I think it was about three years ago we implemented a reverse bid program for these hard to get places. Would uh, some of these communities qualify for that or has that been tried? Director Mackey. Yes, so I believe you're talking about the line extension program and that is a program, I'm sorry, I didn't address you and address you, apologize, I try to do better. Um, yes, um, so the line extension program would be, and I think when we're talking about the density and picking up those here and there, that this, uh, the line extension can work if a line is nearby and that the bid uh, process that we get a provider to participate in that and pick up those locations. I think, you know, it goes a little bit more with what Senator is trying to explain is they're not nearby yet. So there is no line to be able to extend and pick those areas up. And so, you know, I think that's the challenge is, you know, these ones and twos that we were hoping to pick up and we continue to pick up in line extension, just we can't pick up if the infrastructure isn't there yet. So I think that's more to the point. Thank you, Commissioner. Sir Names. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Mackey, uh, when a fund goes dry, so to speak, uh, with no more money to give out to others who are on the uh, application list, what happens to those that have already applied that aren't going to get funded? Do they stay on your list? Do they then get reprioritized? Or what's the process? Or do they have to go through another application process to get back into good graces with the commission? Director Mackey. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Putnam and Senator. So, um, 
I don't, thank you. Uh, so I think I'll explain this with the two different programs. So the line extension program, if a resident or business applies for that program, they only need to do it once. It stays in the hopper. Then the next round of bidding processes for uh, providers to, to see if they would be able to serve them, they stay in there. So that's rolling. When it comes to the border to border program applications, as well as the low population, um, oftentimes if they're great applications, we'll work with the provider and, and give them the best feedback we can, but they do reapply. Um, hopefully that work isn't as cumbersome the second time around because some of that engineering is done, some of the local match and, and different components, the budgeting, you know, we know they'll have to update budgets because of cost, but in general, they'll relook at that application and reapply the next time around. Um, as far as funding itself, there's additional round. We have funding for one more round of $50 million. And so we are you know, confident that the applications that do not get funded this grant round will probably turn around and apply again. Same, same. Must be my phone. There we go. Where's technology? That's right. <laughs> We need broadband to you. <laughs> <laughs> At the Capitol, okay. places. Oh, so, Mr. Ms. Mackey, uh, regarding that situation with the broadband, a uh, border to border, and the low density, and Senator Hochschild already brought up the fact that there's more applicants for low density than there is border to border. Do are there applications for from one applicant for both? Uh, Senator Anderson, uh, just quickly as a, a point of clarification, just so that everyone's on the same page. We did last year, in terms of our new funding, uh, dedicate 60% uh, of new funding to low-density programs and 40% to the, the general. Was it the backwards? That was the other way around? Yeah. Right, take that back. Precisely right, the Mackey, point, Mr. Question. Chair. Sure. <laughs> Ms. Mackey. Sorry, Chair, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yes, 30 million went into the traditional border to border, 20 million to the low population. And I do believe the intent of, the, of where you are coming from, not to speak for you, is because it was such a new program and we weren't really sure. Um, and also using the taxpayer dollars, knowing we still have a lot of applications for the 50% um, eligible cost. Um, and so I think, you know, certainly we could spend it anywhere you would have directed it. Um, but I think that was sort of um, why it was there. And we just didn't have the history and the knowledge yet on the low population. Members, any other final questions? We have to expedite. Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. And uh, Ms. Mackey, uh, can you give us a quick update on the 2022 funding, which was, I believe, around 200 million. I know some of that was slow, uh, slow in getting out because it was some federal money uh, in part. Uh, with that, I'm going to blend into the question, uh, where, what's the status of the mapping that was also funded? Because that was an effort with some of the dollars uh, just a couple of years ago with the idea that there is not, in some places, many places, perfect or, or very good maps because if, if, it, if a map shows that broadband's far away but really it's closer, that impedes the next projects from, from moving or becoming better projects. And so I know uh, a couple of years ago we, we, we diverted some dollars to mapping because there was a general consensus that we need, we need more precise maps so we can really uh, laser focus where, where, where the need is and where low density um, is harder to reach versus where there maybe is internet closer than, than the maps are, are currently per, uh, showing us. So wrap that into two things into one question if you could. Director Mackey. Thank you, Chairman and Senator. So I think um, at my previous presentation, I can send this around again. We do mapping and it's updated twice a year. So November 2023 is our most recent maps. Um, and I will also say we have a pretty robust mapping uh, modular on our website where uh, we can provide technical assistance to any resident that would uh, get a hold of us or providers can use it. And, and residents like me, and I've told you this many times, I'm not techie and I can use this program. 
to find out who my provider is in the area, what are my speeds. There's also speed test modulars available as well. So consumers can take a look at those pieces. Um, I didn't necessarily want to complicate the water, but I think this is also a good opportunity to remind everyone about the broadband equity access and deployment funding that will be coming from the federal uh, government based on the unserved locations. Um, that FCC map was what designated the $652 million to come to our state. And we will be starting a challenge process at, at the Office of Broadband in the next couple months to make sure that um, Local units of government, ISPs, internet service providers, and nonprofits can go and challenge locations on that map and make sure that there are accurate data on if a location is unserved or underserved, if it was missed, um, if it is an old shack in the middle of a field that is never going to get served. We want those taken off so more money can go to the locations uh, that are not currently being served. So the mapping is going, this is going to be a really critical time um, for the state of Minnesota to make sure we're capturing all of the locations um, and will provide us a really good data set on what is still left to serve. Hopefully I answered both of your questions. And, and, and Mr. Question. Chair, uh, Senator, or Director Mackey, how much of the money from 2022 has been out the door and is there still some left uh, going through future rounds? And I. I'm going to just embed the next question with this. Um, what kind of response are you seeing to those traditional 50% grants? Or, or uh, if we're, if, we're uh, if the RFPs for 50 million, are you finding only 40 million apply? Are you finding 60 million apply? Or are you finding a double or more apply yet? Dr. Mackey, if you could please. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Senator. So I will just speak on the last latest round of funding that we had um, last fall. Uh, again, we use capital projects funding that also included a little bit additional dollars that you're talking about. Um, and in that application process of the traditional border to border, there were 21 projects we were able to fund. There were 60 applications, and we had about 37 million available, but the request was over 100 million. So, but again, now looking at this next round, as far as the biennium funding of the 100 million you gave, we um, are, have not made any awards on that. All the other dollars that we have, whether it was capital projects dollars or state dollars that you all have invested in, have been uh, allocated or awarded uh, to grantees. Um, certainly round seven, round eight, depending on the construction season and, and um, all of those things are still continuing to be done. Um, and, I, and we close out grants uh, all the time. Um, and so we'll, those dollars are being spent and they're being spent well. Thank you, Director Mackey. Uh, Senator Westrom, if I may, uh, with your indulgence, we do have one bill left to do and this is something we're gonna keep talking about. So uh, uh, if uh, your final comment is brief, uh, uh, we can do that. Uh, Thank you, Senator Westrom. I appreciate your, your uh, flexibility. I assume this is being laid over and we're not moving. Yes, yeah, so you're quite. Yeah, we, we, it'll okay. be laid over. So we can keep talking about it. And Senator Kunish has one last quick comment. Please. Just one quick question. Um, are tribal nations um, eligible for, for these grants as well, or are they receiving federal dollars to help with their, um, their broadband issues? Director Mackey. Thank you, Chairman and Senator. That's an excellent question, so it's twofold. There are the National uh, Telecommunications Information Association does have direct tribal grants that our tribal partners can directly apply with the federal government for. Um, they are also eligible for our border-to-border -border grant programs and will also be eligible for the BEAD dollars. We do give priorities to uh, providers that have um, that tribal support. We certainly would not, um, you know, fund a project that um, our tribal partners are not comfortable or would like to have. Um, but we definitely look at all of those grants and make sure that those partnerships um, and communications are happening. Thank you. Uh, Senator Housetoff, closing comments on Senate File 3952, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I, I think this was a great discussion. Um, it's clear that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to broadband. I would just challenge us to think about how we set up state programs and grants so that they reach all Minnesotans. Again, this discussion surrounded going from 50% to 75% to potentially 90%. 
but we could arguably make the same arguments the reverse way. Why don't we go down to 40% or 30% because there would be above demand for the amount of grants available anyway. So why don't we save the state some more money? Well, we don't do that because we want to try to reach all Minnesotans as best we can. So I think it's just really important for us to realize that there are very, very rural areas that even under this lowest density mechanism that we have set up still don't qualify. And it's because they don't have the lo local property tax. It's because they don't have the businesses. It's because they already are behind on all the other challenges that they face as a rural community. So the least we could do is give them some broadband so they can work, play, live, have a quality of life that all of us deserve. So I hope you'll join me in exploring these ideas, maybe not this bill in particular, but something that makes sure we're getting these broadband dollars equitably to our communities. Thank Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Senator House Child. Senate file 3952 will be laid over for possible inclusion. As amended. Uh, uh, members, our next bill is Senate file 3703. Senator Liskey, please. Senator Liskey, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I know we're running short on time, so in order to expedite, uh, expedite our uh, stuff on 3703, uh, I know that Senator Kupak has a couple of friendly amendments, so maybe we'll let him move those first, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Senator Kupak, please, to your amendments. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I would like to move uh, the A1 amendment. Um, with this amendment, uh, after talking with Senator Liskey, um, I, for some reason, seem to be a stray magnet. Uh, I get stray cats, stray dogs, stray guinea pigs even one time. Uh, and uh, in my, I don't even ask why, I don't know. Even, even last week, I'm walking in downtown St. Paul, I found a stray dog. Uh, don't know, I'm just that guy. Um, but, and so in my, so when we were going through the bill, uh, in my community, we do not, uh, the, this bill involves reporting to the, the city clerk. In my community, we have, a, we have a, an animal control officer. So the A1 amendment just kind of puts in uh, animal control officer uh, as also if you turned it over to the pound, um, you're, you're, you're good by doing that because that is what I usually do in my communities. And then um, also, Ch Mr. Chair, uh, because I am trying to get nicest senator of the day award, I would also like to move the A2 amendment, uh, which would modify the A1 amendment. Uh, so, Senator Kupek, uh, procedurally, I think that we have to okay. uh, do the A1 first. So, do so this is an amendment, amendment, to amendment to the amendment, to the right. amendment okay. first. Sure. Right. Uh, is my understanding we have to deal with that first? Uh, and also, I want to applaud your low expectations for being favorite senator of the day. <laughs> uh, that's a good place to be. Um, so, members, to the A2 amendment, if you would like uh, uh, the A1. A1 amendment, please. Um, no, it's the amendment to the amendment is where we start. That's right. what I was saying. We do the A2 first. Uh, so, to the A2 amendment, Senator Kubik, could you actually just explain that for us real quick? Sure. This amendment to the amendment, the A2. Sure. The amendment to the amendment uh, is to actually uh, remove the word penalty and then also uh, remove the the for failure to give notice required by this clause uh, for the finder liable uh, to the owner and the astray and also for damages. Uh, so really, it doesn't do a whole lot to the bill, but it does, uh, as a nice guy, I do, then Senator Liskey will not have to take this bill to judiciary. And um, I, I think, you know, I try, to, I try to be friend, sorry to those members that are on this committee who are on judiciary, uh, but <laughs> to speed the process along, it's, it's, it would just be a little unnecessary stop. And I'm trying to lighten the load of judiciary, so I also think that I am being a nice senator for that reason, too. So, Senator Liskey, can you tell us your feelings about this one? So, uh, both, both are friendly, as uh, Senator Seberger will attest. Uh, she doesn't probably want to see me in judiciary on this bill that hopefully would not need to go there, so... So amendments, uh, members, let's first deal with the amendment to the amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please say aye. Aye. 
I amendment, the amendment is passed. Now to the underlying amendment, uh, Senator Kupek. I think we've discussed that a fair amount a little bit already. Yep. Senator Liske, your feelings? Again, this is a friendly amendment as it helped get a, a direction as to where to report uh, astray animals. So this is a good amendment as well. Thank you, Senator Liske. So to the amended amendment, uh, members all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment to the amendment is passed. Senator Liske, to the underlying bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, committee, uh, I am glad to be here to help uh, fix an error that occurred last session um, in, in the process of removing astray books from the books. Kind of a redundant statement, but removing astray books, the issue was that it removed some language that required people to report astray animals. And in this case, this is going to put that language back in without interfering with the county recorders. And I also have him here, uh, one of the representatives from the county recorders here as well, who will be happy to come and let you know that, yes, this doesn't cause any trouble for them. So with that being said, I try and shave as much time off because uh, my experts are sitting next to me that can talk about why this is important, and uh, I'll let them begin. So. Will you please state your full name for the record and then commence your testimony when you'd like. Kimberly Dimmick, owner of Dakota Ridge Stables in Dakota County. Mr. Chair, committee members, it came to my surprise a few months ago that um, Statute 34602 had been repealed last year. Um, I'm a big advocate for animals. And online, every day, there's tons of animals going missing and people posting, looking for their pets. And... A lot of the time you see people making comments, don't give it back, they don't deserve it. Why, why was it running? It doesn't look cared for. And when an animal gets lost, you don't know how long it's been out there running and the condition it's in or why it's in that condition. And so I, a lot of times, will post this statute to let people know you can't keep that animal, you can't give it away, you can't sell it, it needs to be brought back to its rightful owner. I have a family friend who recently had a cat wander up to his house. The cat wasn't in the best condition. He posts, anybody want a cat? I said, you can't give that cat away. Went through this big discussion. The same day in Hastings, an elderly dog was found. They posted a picture asking who, if anyone knew whose dog it was. And the comments start coming in. Don't return that dog to the owner. They're not taking care of it. You know, and it's a scenario that you see over and over and over and over again. So when I saw that this had been repealed, I went to go post it, and it came up repealed. And I'm like, repealed? What happened? So I started digging into it. And I had seen Mark's story on his dog, Buddy. He recently lost his dog in January. And it was a story was done by Bab Santos at Channel 9 News. So I reached out to Bab Santos, and I said, hey, this has gotten repealed, you know, can you help me with this? So he did some digging and he got me some information on what happened. And I reached out to the authors of the bill that repealed it. And unfortunately, um, two House representatives were the only ones who responded back to me. Um, one of them was Jamie Becker Finn. And her comment was, thank you for sharing your concern. This did not come up at all during any of the public hearings on this bill, but I will look into it further. So it was in an omnibus bill and didn't get discussed, so but nobody really knew they were voting on taking this out. The other response I got was from Sandra Feist. And she said basically that the county recorders had all agreed to take this out because they didn't want to have their stray books anymore. And that it was a bipartisan bill and everybody was in agreement with it. And she made a comment that, um, <coughs> really bothered me. She said, animals are considered property and they are protected under theft laws. Well, the problem is an astray wasn't stolen in the first place. So there's no protection under any stolen laws. So in all my digging, I reached out to um, Troy Olson from MACO, the Minnesota Association of County Recorders and had the best conversation about this. And he said, that was never our intention of removing this stat part of the statute. They, the recorders just wanted to get rid of their books because they didn't use them anymore. So then I reached, started reaching out to everybody I could, trying to get somebody to, to take up this issue to get this put back into law to help these animals and these pet owners. And Senator Liskey, thank God, stepped up and took control of it, and 
so just to kind of give you an idea, in this, 10 million animals go missing in the United States alone. 65% make their way back home. Or 60, I'm sorry, 65% find their way back home. So there's a lot of animals that never even make it back home. There's, in Minnesota, there's 930,000 pet dogs and 1,264,000 pet cats as of the latest statistics that I could find, which was 2011. That's a lot of animals. There's 90 million plus head of livestock in Minnesota, which includes cattle, horses, pigs, whatever. And this astray statute covered all of those animals if they got lost. So now our state is sitting at a point where your animal gets out, somebody finds it, they can do whatever they want at this point. They can keep it, they can give it away, they can sell it. There's no law in the books at this point making them have to give it back to the owner or notify somebody that they found it. And so I reached out to Mark and I said, could you come tell your story for us here and let people know how devastating it is for someone to lose a pet first and then to not get it back. And right now, unfortunately in Mark's situation, if somebody has his dog and they found it, how is he gonna get it back? There's, he's got no legal recourse to get his dog back. And we would hope people would be human and just return it, you know. You'd hope, but there's people out there that aren't gonna do that. And so that is why I'm here advocating hard to get this back on the books. Thank you, Ms. Demick. So, uh, Mr. Pfeffer? Yes. Pfeffer, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Pfeffer, and um, I live in the western suburbs. Um, and I was wondering if I could see a show of hands. Um, first of all, thank you, Chairman and committee members, for having me here. A show of hands of uh, who have had or um, grown up with a, a pet in your family. Yes. Well, here, here's our dog. Here's our dog, Buddy. <clears throat> He's been missing for 56 days. Um, it's hard, hard, hard on the family. Um, <clears throat> there's reason to believe that he was taken, and uh, there, were, there was an advertisement on Craigslist for this exact dog three days <clears throat> after he, he was missing. He, he left our yard. Um, through an electric fence, and we've had search parties, um, many, many search parties, heat-seeking drones. We put out hundreds of ads throughout the state, <clears throat> and it's just very difficult. And so hearing this law that fell off the books, I really want to make sure it gets taken care of so we can get our dog back and other families as well. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Pfeffer. Uh, members, questions or comments about the bill or of the testifiers? Senator Gustafson. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say I'm so sorry. That's just heartbreaking. Thank I you. can't imagine. And um, if this can help, I hope it does. Thank you. But what a cute dog. I'm so sorry. And uh, uh, Mr. Pfeffer, I'm, for my own part, thank you for being here to share your story. You're welcome. Um, that's um, a really important thing to do, to advocate not just for you and your family and your situation, but for other families in similar situations. Yeah. Senator Western. Mr. Chair, um, uh, Senator Lischke, just to tie a bow on this, uh, your, your bill re restores the statute as we had it. Uh, briefly, just kind of connect the dots then. By putting this back in statute, or, or one of your testifiers, um, we're, we're basically going to return to some of the processes of people uh, needing or being compelled to uh, either find the, give it to the owner if they know, or notify a local, back in my day growing up, we called it the dog catcher, but uh, local animal control. Uh, and and that that's kind of the summary of it. and, and that process is, is what both testifiers are, are wanting or thinking would be much better to, to connect and have the best chance to reconnect with that missing pet. Is that, 
Is that kind of an accurate summary, or you tie the bow on it, if you could, please? Senator Liskey. Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, uh, Senator Westrom, I'd tie the bow on it. You've kind of described exactly how, how it'll work. So uh, the county recorders were asking to basically remove the astray books. And the reason the astray books were an issue is this, this statute was written in, I believe, 1905 from my research on this. So it's a, it's a pretty old piece of statute. Um, and um, Senate counsel here, Ms. Painter, helped quite thoroughly get this so that we wouldn't have issues with the, the county recorders again. Um, and so basically it puts back on the books that you have to report a missing animal that you found. And so you would report it to your local city clerk. Um, you would report it to animal control. Now, thanks to Senator Kupak for that addition. Basically, you would have to report the animal. And so then if you know whose it is, you now get to return the animal to the right rightful owner. And so this, this basically takes away the ability to go, well, it's a stray. There's no rules about a stray, so I can do whatever I want with it. Um, and so this would basically remove that ability for the, the person to do that and instead would have to return it to the owner. So, Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Liskey, um, for, for bringing this bill and the discussions we've had on it. And um, my wife will always, she, we, we have a rule in our house, we have no, no movies, no shows that are involve uh, anything that happens to dogs. And so um, even, you know, even I feel, I feel so bad for you. They are such a good part of our lives, and, and I know what it means. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Ah, the mic works. Uh, Senator Liskey, it mentions here uh, for the failure to give notice uh, required by the the, uh, the section, the finder is liable uh, of double the amount of damages sustained by the owner. How's that determined, uh, Senator so Liskey? Senator Anderson, Mr. Chair, sorry about that. Um, so that was edited out. That's what the A2 amendment took out. So that's the language that we would we removed so that judiciary doesn't have to argue over what that would actually mean and what that would entail. So, Senator Anderson. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Liskey, there are no damages then. Uh, Mr. Senator Chair. Liskey. Yes, that is correct, Senator Anderson. So originally we were writing the bill so that there would be a, a damages inclusion so that we would have more compelling evidence or reason to to return the animal, but. With the uh, lack of time in judiciary, and hopefully to get this at least back on the books in some way, shape, or form, this was the the best solution to to this at this moment. And we may have to revisit it later, but at least this gets taken care of to to get some language back in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any other questions, comments? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, just uh, are we going to move this to the floor? Is it in shape to do that? And What's your plans for this? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to move it if that's what we're going to do, but if you've got somebody in line for it already, that's fine too. Uh, Senator Westermar, our intent uh, at this point is to hold it over for future uh, inclusion in our omnibus bill. Uh, uh, spoiler alert, it's going to go in. <laughs> um, uh, I'm open to considering sending it directly to the floor, but I would like to talk to leadership and other people before I would make such a commitment. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'd be open to sending it to the floor sometime soon if we could, if you want to talk it over, and, and also put it in a, a final omnibus bill. I kind of always follow the Phyllis, I'd advise the Phyllis Kahn rule, bury it, bur bury it early and often, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Senator Rester, with, uh, uh, given the uh, advice and the general commitment that I, I'm feeling from our committee on this one, uh, we're going to put it on the table. Uh, and reserve the possibility of uh, um, taking it to the floor or putting it in our omnibus bill. Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm looking for a, a motion uh, to table, uh, to put the bill on the table. Uh, Senator Kunish moves to put the uh, Senate file 3703 as amended uh, on the table. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Senate file 3703 as amended is now on the table. Um, Senator Liskey, would you like to say a few final moments, comments? Other than uh, thank you to the committee and thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing me out on the floor when I brought this to your attention because I don't think anybody intended to harm animals in the, in the removal of that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, 
All right. Well, that's our last order of business for the day. Uh, members, our next meeting will be Monday, March 4th. The agenda is already posted online. We will have five bills, Senate File 4070, just from Senator McEwen, uh, Senate File 4214 from Senator Mee, uh, Senate File 4026, Senator Dreheim, and then two bills from Senator, our own Senator Westrom. That's what we're doing on Monday. Until then, uh, have a great weekend. See you around. And the committee is adjourned.